Welcome to the Voices of War, a podcast with a simple vision, to bring to life the true costs of war through the voices of those who've lived it. I'm your host, Maz, and I hope you enjoy this episode. My guest today is Thomas Latsutanosic, also known as Tomo. I met Tomo during our adventures in Sarajevo back in 2014. Unbeknownst to me back then, Tomo was already a well-known figure across the Balkans and beyond for being an extreme alpinist and long-distance athlete, but also for his promotion of cooperation and unity across the region. As one of the many who, as a young man, served in the Bosnian War from 92 to 95, Tomo spent the whole time in his city, Sarajevo. At the end of the war, he became a beacon of positivity across the region by promoting tolerance, hard work and patience. He was one of the few who, in the early days after the war, sought to become the change he wanted to see in his community. This quest has led him to conquering some of the world's highest mountains, including Mount Blanc, Grosglokna, Elbrus, Ararat, Akongua, Denali, and the famous Marahun. He completed more than 15 marathons around the world, including four of the world's major marathons in Berlin, Boston, New York City, and London. Recently, he also became the first person from the former Yugoslav republics to complete the prestigious and most extreme triathlon in the world, Norseman in Norway. If this was not enough, he is also one of the co-founders of the Sarajevo Half Marathon, the largest international sporting event in Bosnia and Herzegovina, and also the man who helped a blind runner complete his first half marathon. He is an inspirational individual who speaks unashamedly about his optimism and love of life. Tomo, thanks for joining me. Uh, you're welcome. Thank you for inviting me to your podcast. Just as a, uh, for our listeners, a, a very brief disclaimer. I've come to know Tomo during our time in Sarajevo, during a project we established. And Tomo was one of those people that supported us from the early days and was almost a bit of a champion for some of the things that we did. And even though I've just read a very quick bio, perhaps you can give us a, a snapshot of your background. Uh, I was born. I was born in Croatia, raised in Bosnia. I spent the war time in Balkans, in Bosnia, in Sarajevo, the city that was under siege. Actually, it was the longest under siege in the modern modern history. And um, I got married in Sarajevo as well. Um, I have a wonderful wife, and uh, I have a son. He's he's twenty three now. He was born nineteen ninety seven. And also, the, I'm, um, I wouldn't say that I'm athlete, but, but I'm, a, I'm a big fan of the sport or any outdoor activities because, uh, I have, I have the simple credo that I work to live. I don't live to work. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying, I'm trying as much as I can, um, which includes swimming at uh, five, six o'clock in the morning. And I like triathlons. I like climbing the mountains. So all in all, I'm just I'm just trying to live the to live the good life, the meaning I'd say meaningful life. Mm-hmm. Let's put it that way. And I knew that that was going to be a difficult question because it's very difficult for someone with your background and such diverse experiences to focus in on you know your background because uh, we probably need four podcasts for that. So thank you for that. <laughs> but uh, but where I was and as this uh, podcast is about the experiences of war, what I'd like to do is perhaps start with those experiences of war. And as we move along, I really want to come back into the discussion on the impact of war on you and your life, because ultimately this podcast is really about bringing to life the stories of war, the real stories of war and the real cost of war to those who have never experienced it. So you you mentioned that you spent the longest siege in modern history, uh, 1,425 days uh, Sarajevo was, uh, was under siege. And of course, that's also my city of birth, and, and I have a particular fond uh, memory of my childhood from there. But there was a, there, I do distinctly remember the time when we transitioned from peace to war. I was only 10. And the only reason we moved from where we lived uh, was because it was the first time ever my mum could hear the river. It was that quiet that day. <laughs> but the following wow. morning, she freaked out and went, okay, something's wrong. We need to move into town. So maybe um, yeah. can you describe or think back to those moments? What memories do you have of those first days of, of, of the siege? Yeah, I, I think that um, 
at, at that time, back in 1992, the, the one morning I woke up and found myself under siege. And, and literally that way, because it's not Napoleon time mm. where two big armies that clashes. You're just in the middle of the conflict that you didn't want to believe is going to happen in, in, in the heart of the Europe. At, at that time, I was a student of the mechanical engineering and uh, I was reading... Um, I remember the book that was on my the shelf next to the bed. Next to my bed was an autobiography of the Keith Richards. Huh. It's a it's a, it's interesting story. <laughs> he, he he his life is really interesting. So listening to Rolling Stones, the study about Keith Richards and his life. I'm not saying that I would follow his example, of course. Mm -hmm. And studying mechanical engineering, and then you find yourself in the middle of the conflict that. I didn't. I didn't understand uh, why. I understood so some some parts of it, but you are someone just turned the switch to different mode, mm. and then you are supposed to survive. And I found myself in the city that was under siege, and uh, the city that lost eleven thousand and above eleven thousand uh, citizens who died during mm. during that siege as a, as a victim of the of the war in, in, in Sarajevo. And, and simply that uh, now it's easy to talk, to talk after my war experience yeah. because first I survived, I'm here and I'm, and I'm alive. And uh, you can get out from the, from the war with the two things, with the, new, with the new list, let's call it, the, to reset the values in your life, or you can get the PTSD. I said, if you survived. So I, I, I tried hard to understand and to learn something from that conflict. And um, at the beginning, uh, I'd like to say that war never brought anything good to anyone. So let's, let's just forget about it. There are no winners. I mean, there are sometimes the winners in the history, but there are no real winners. So that, 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 that type of the conflict is, is simply is not bringing any good, any good to people, who, regardless which, which side you are on. And then I decided to reset the list of the important things in my life and to try to understand what's that that I was taking for granted before the war. So you start to appreciate the small things. And as you know as well that we didn't have enough food. We didn't have electricity. We didn't have water. So after the war, I appreciate those small things. So shower is not something that I take as granted. I appreciate that. The fridge um, full of food and I can go and buy in the market um, or you know, in the store whatever I want and uh, I'm not hungry and I'm not thirsty. Those are the things that, that I really appreciate and my life is really great because I, I reached the, uh, actually I, I hit the bottom. No. So anything, anything above that is really makes me happy. So I enjoy the small things. I'm happy with the small things and everything above that is just a bonus. And I think that I became a better person. And, and really, because that's, that's not experience that, that I'd say that I, I wouldn't like anyone to go through that, but it wasn't my choice. And, but now, after, after everything, I think it's also, sh it also shaped me somehow as a, as a person. So, so I, I appreciate much the, I appreciate more small things. I appreciate more people. I have the, I have the very, I'm very open minded. I understand the different cultures. I like different people to, to listen to hear. And because, um, I learned the lesson in them. In a hard way, how is that when the people are in conflict and fighting for, for ideas? Mm -hmm. I'm quoting that, I, that, that ideas. So, so that would be that would be maybe maybe a little bit philosophic, but that would be my that would be my uh, the war experience and what I learned from that. And I would like also to add, as you know, I was um, I was climbing some some of the highest mountain in the world, and uh, I was wondering why I'm doing that. The same answer to appreciate what I have in the valley. So when you when you come back from from Alaska climbing Denali on a brutal cold wind in a small tent without a cell phone signal and uh, being there with just with your team or your partner and uh, people ask you why do you do that because you have the heating at home you you have a car you have a job why why do you do that 
I said because to feel to feel that that gratitude to to yeah. to be a grateful person. Yeah. So when you get back, in order to make a coffee, climbing the high mountains of expedition, yeah. it takes about one hour of the hard work. You need yeah. to to need to cut the ice. You need to melt that ice. Before that, you need to wake up in a very cold tent, and uh, you have to wait for the water to boil. Before that, you you have to go, you have to make the pressure in the bottle for the gas and all that stuff. So so it's a lot of work for the cup of coffee. Yeah, it's a project. In our, yeah. in that, that that it's a big yeah. project. It's really hard. It's cold. You're tired. It's 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 above the five five thousand meters, whatever there's that in in in, in, in Imperial Major I know. Yeah. Are you there on the metric no, no, Imperial? Not, no, 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 a feet. We're, we're, no, no, yeah. no. We're, so, we're, in meters, we're fine. <laughs> so everything above 5,000 meters, you are so tired doing everything. When you get back to Valley, you know how much cost that, how much cost that espresso, the nice one that you are served, one, two dollars maybe yeah, or something. Yeah, so, right. so, so you appreciate, you appreciate, you appreciate the tapped water. You yeah. appreciate the food in the fridge. All, you don't all have the to comforts bring. that we take for granted in, in everyday life. And, and I definitely want to come back to that because I think there is a natural link between your experiences of war to, you know, ultimately your personal war on the mountain. But just thinking back to, to Sarajevo and the siege. So you mentioned no water, no food, no electricity. One of the things that I find difficult, and I've only had a couple of months in Sarajevo before we fled to Germany, but my dad stayed behind and I've spent many many days, months even, talking to him about those experiences. Can you describe for those who've never experienced that or have never had the chance to talk to someone what that means? No water, no food, no power. Describe that. Describe the feelings, the sensations that go along with that in a city under siege. What is? What do we mean by the siege? So Describe those moments on that time. So, so first, I would, like to, I would like to say, and also I would like to be the politically correct and sensitive without, without offending the third world. But Sarajevo is the capital of Bosnia-Herzegovina in the former Yugoslavia. Mm -hmm. We had a national theater. We had a Coke factory over there. Yeah. And it was, uh, we had the Winter Olympics, yes. 1984. Yeah. So we are not talking about some, some city somewhere on the planet, you know, the hidden. So we are in the heart of the Europe and uh, with, a, with, a, with a such a rich history in the town, uh, our architecture and everything. So First, first to put it place in the context, you know, where we are. Yeah. And then, then you find yourself, you are, the city is under siege and no electricity, no food, no water. It's unbelievable how adaptable creatures we are. You somehow switch in a survival mode and you do what you have to do in order to survive and to, to defend yourself. Speaking about it, siege in siege, siege, Sarajevo siege and, and the war, wartime, I think if we had some kind of the back road or something that everyone would leave. Unfortunately, it wasn't possible later, in the a, in a, in a later days of the siege, it wasn't possible. So you just, you just fight for, you, for, for yourself and for your family. I'm not talking about ideals. I'm not talking mm -hmm. about any politics, ideas or something. Mm -hmm. You just fight to survive. And when you fight to survive and when you fight to, to defend your family, I'm talking about ideology, you are the worst enemy that anyone can get. Because you have, you have nothing, you know, you have nothing to lose. Yeah. You have, you have to confront whatever, whatever you have to, whatever comes, comes your direction. Yeah. So not, not easy, but you understand that we are capable of the much more than what we are aware of. So let's, let's pull the parallel or something, draw the line. Now, maybe it's a silly to talk about the wartime and endurance yeah. sports, but yeah. really, until you try, you don't know. You don't know what's going on. So it was the same that war experience and the same is in triathlon. Until you try the Ironman race, which I did five times, and uh, you don't know if you're capable to do that. And yes, yes, you are. Actually, we all are. We, we, can, we can all do beautiful things and magnificent things, but we just, we just, need, we just need to try. Because there is... There is, there is I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to try to, to say it in, um, in, in Japan, they say there is, there is a saying that if you think you can't do something, try to do that for one minute and then, then, figure, out, then figure out if you're going to continue. And in most of the cases, yes, you will continue. And, uh, but that's, that's it. So you're just, you just, you just in survival mode and uh, go through that. It is what it is. Yeah. 
What I mean, you, you mentioned that you know people stop fighting for some ideology or an idea that it's about the person next to you, it's your family. Talk about that a little bit. What, what do you mean by that? First, first of all, I think that that war veterans and the people who experienced that all that the pain, all that all muddy trenches, you know, the way of the casket with your dead, you know, yeah. friend. I think they are they are the biggest peacemakers because yeah. they've been there, they've seen that, and uh, I think that the loud people who are loud about the war, about the conflict, are actually those who never experienced it, who never, who never spend the night in a muddy trench or, 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 or being in the cold or, or just be afraid for your life. It's very natural that you are, that the, the, the fear is natural. Being afraid for, for yourself, for your company, yes, it's it's natural. So if, so I'm not I'm not big fan of those you know the big kind of heroes stories. Yeah. There are hero stories, and and I, I respect that a lot. But we are just human beings, and we are not made you know to kill <laughs> each yeah. others because of the idea. At at the end, if you go back in history, for every war on every conflict, I wouldn't say every, but yeah. for the most of them, the things could be solved. Um, dialogue yeah the dialogue and just just communicating better and talking to each others and uh and understanding also someone else needs we need often when we think about something to do so to to do something we need often to put the to put the shoes of those on the other side yeah. and to try to think to put their shoes on and to try to think to understand to understand also their views. I, I call it tolerancy. Tolerancy yeah, is not yeah. a weakness. Tolerancy yeah. is respecting the, someone else to, to have their yeah, own respecting views. Respecting their views and, and acknowledging their views. Yes, but of course, but of course, I didn't have yeah. a choice. If, yeah. if you are attacked, you have the full right in every religion. You have a full right to defend yourself and to, and, and to defend those who need your, who needs your help. Yeah. But I will. I, I would never attack someone, and I would never go go against someone. So I, I haven't, I haven't leave my. You know, I, I stayed in my town. I didn't go somewhere else to cause problems to someone else. Yeah, you defended your your town, your people, and your right your right to live. Ultimately, yes, that's right to live. Down. It's a, exactly. a and, and and I really like the point that you made about the you know that you don't like the kind of glorifying of war or, or those who are the loudest about war often have. The least experience and, and truth to be told that's very much the motivation of this podcast in, in the first place it's about speaking to those who have experienced it in hope to promote peace as the right way uh, to go forward to I, those who experienced I, it yeah yeah i uh, you know maz um, i apologize in advance if it, if this doesn't sound like 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 a hollywood movie and those war stories no. but i'm just trying i'm just trying to tell you from my heart how i feel about it and uh and I would like to spread the word about, about my war experience in a way that the, the worst piece is yeah. always better than, than the best, you know, the worst solution or whatever. So, yeah. so we should don't apologize. It's, it, please don't apologize because that is exactly why I want to speak to, mm. to, to you and people like yourself. So that's, this is the, the, the true uh, nature of war that I want to talk about. The, the, you, you also mentioned, um, uh, you know, about, you know, we're not designed to kill each other. And I, and I, again, I totally agree. But thinking to Bosnia and Sarajevo in particular, where literally neighbor turned on neighbor overnight. How does that happen? What, what motivates people? What drives people to, you know, how does that switch happen overnight? You, you know, that, that the ethnic hatred and, and the nationalism uh, because we didn't have the, any the race issues, because we are all, I, I'd like to say, we are all the same, uh, the nations separated by, by the same language, yes. <laughs> which, yes. Is, yes. which is really yes. funny because yes. we speak the same language <laughs> in, in the Balkans and we are so hard trying to separate from each other's looking for differences that is really sometimes hard to find yeah. because we share the same customs culture is very similar we speak the same language and try so hard to be different than my neighbor yeah. so I, i'd say first it's a it's a lack of the lack of edu education mm -hmm. and lack of the good word to be spread it around and uh, 
you know, the, the good people are sometimes silent. They, they're not loud. Good people, good people are just good people and they do whatever they do. And uh, usually the bad guys, they have the big mouth and, and they cause that noise. And uh, simply at, in the 90s, in, in the Balkans, with that, the project that was coming from the, at that time, the president of the, of the Serbia, Milosevic, who was later on found, you know, kind of in a, yeah. in a war tribunal, uh, guilty for well, for what he did. And actually, you know, it's it's not something that, that will make comments because mm -hmm. we don't yeah, comment no, court yeah. verdicts. Yeah. It is it's a verdict, and that's it. But um, I think I think the lack of education and uh, and the simply the media too. Yeah. Media was media was actually the adding fuel on the fire already. So. So I think that media that played a very important role in the negative context uh, during the war in the Balkans, because that, that, that propaganda and, and the things that, that you could hear were really unbelievable. From the, it's, it, doesn't, it doesn't make any sense what you hear. So, so, so media uh, on one side would report about the other side. In, in, let, let's say, for, for an instance, in Sarajevo, we've heard that at that time, the, the TV uh, on the side of the, let's say on the other side, yeah. they reported that the kids are thrown in the cages with the lions in the zoo, or kids that are kind of of the other nation. The Which research, I think, yeah. come on, come on, just 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 a common sense and just just think about it twice. But people people would buy it, and they would become mad and they would go against neighbors. So media. The media was actually in the service of the politics. Mm -hmm. So it is very important to have independent medias and uh, it is very important to vote and to be educated and to understand yeah. the messages. Because Balkan was historically always some kind of the, the crossroad of the Europe where the cultures were colliding from the Ottoman Empire and uh, yeah. Austrian, Austrian Hungarian monarchy and uh, yeah. actually the First World War. I, well, Sarajevo assassination of the Archduke Ferdinand. Uh, it, it, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't uh, the reason why the war started, but actually that's what ignited the Syria of the events that actually led to the First World War. World War started in my city. Yeah. So, so I'd a, say media and lack of education. Yeah, media and education. I, I really like that because it, it, it's about propagating fear, right? It's about creating fear of the unknown, creating the fear of the other. And that story about you know, children being thrown to lions. I mean, that's a, yeah, like you say, it's nonsensical and it really shouldn't, uh, uh, it shouldn't have the impact that it does, but it's, uh, it's amazing how, how vulnerable people can be in uncertainty when, it's, when there's this, some call it the fog of war or just a, a moment of uncertainty and how quickly people side with, you know, those who they consider, quote, unquote, uh, on their side. And I think Sarajevo is a, is a, is, is a good, good example of that. That's, I, I, I agree with you. You said it really very well, but I'm not at that language proficiency to, to, <laughs> say, it that, to say that nice as you, as you did. But that's, that's exactly the, yeah. the fear and the people yeah. became the people. They, they are vulnerable and they are easy to manipulate. Yeah. And, but it, it, comes, it comes from, the, from also that lack of the education and... Uh, and independent media to hear the to hear the yeah. truth and yeah, and what's right. where, where is the truth we need to now we live in the time of the fake news now you, now you have to sanitize you know the, the, even the news to figure out yeah. is that really happened people are sharing the photographs with the, with the text that that doesn't correlate with that photo that was taken maybe six years ago in some different spot but using those social networks and the media uh, that's 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 unbelievable, uh, and uh, how the high percentages of the fake news that are actually the published on a, on a social networks and um, social networks and uh, on those news portals, you know. Yeah, no, you're right, and it's a, it's it's taken it's taken that same problem of the Balkans. It's taken it to scale because now it's you know you don't have to go and look for the media. You know, it, the media is finding you. Uh, you know, your yes. phone's buzzing with information and so on. Um, sure. With just well, I don't know if I, if, if I should say celebrated or commiserated 25 years of the Dayton Peace Accords, which, uh, mm -hmm. you know, stopped the killing, so to speak. But it was a ceasefire and it's still just a ceasefire. Where is Bosnia 25 years later, in your view? 
Well, um, the Dayton Peace Accords, uh, it, it, yeah, it was a ceasefire. It stopped the war. And that was, that was a good thing. 25 years after, um, as you know me, I'm, I'm a big optimist. Yes. I'm big on, 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 on optimism. I think that things are much, much better than, than it was 25 years ago. Of course, we are not happy with the pace, with the rhythm, how we developed and how we are progressing. Uh, I, would, I would like also personally for the things to, 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 to happen faster and to be better, but we have to be patient. Bosnia and Herzegovina consists of the of the many nations and 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 the people people should come up with some kind of the agreement what they want with the respect of the all ethnic groups. So doing something that someone would disagree doesn't make a sense. And speaking about so we comes to negotiation at the Balkans negotiate if you if you accept that other side would have some good ideas. Or, or, or some good proposals and in the Balkans. And I would say in the Western world as well is sometimes very often translated into weakness. No, yeah. no, it's not. Uh, actually, it's the, the really art of the negotiating. Let's find out what are the common interests. What are the things that we can agree about? Let's leave aside uh, our differences. So we'll take care of that later. Let's find out what we can share and what would be good for every one of us. So let's talk about economy. Let's leave, let's leave aside other things. Let's talk about economy. Let's, let's talk about a better life. And of course, to, to guarantee to people that every kind of all human rights and uh, freedom in, in, in its full meaning. Yeah. So I'm talking yeah. about religious freedom that, yeah. and, and human rights, full human rights. So if you ask me, I would just rewrite. The, the Declaration on the Human Rights of the United Nations, and I would put it in the Constitution. It says it's very simple. It's a two, three pages document that says very clearly what you need to be to live in a happy society, to be a happy person. Of course, that's an ideal world, yes. which is not the case in the praxis. But I, I still think that um, we don't have we don't have the leaders yet because the leaders currently in Bosnia are the same same persons who were leaders during the war. So we need the new leaders and it takes time to create them. We need a new generation. We need the new educated young people who will take over. What's interesting is that in Sarajevo, speaking about Sarajevo, the 25 years after, after the war, I think the nationalist politics done recent local elections, they, they lost badly. They lost badly, which is, which is the word of the citizens and the message, you know, we had enough. We want. Yeah. We want the changes. So I would like, it in the political, you know, the battlefield for them to fight for the votes and with the programs, and not pro- not providing the, not protecting just one ethnic group yeah. or, or 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 keeping them or threatening them with the other ethnic groups. Yeah, so the programs on the last last local elections really brought um, some light at the end of the tunnel that we are all looking at. And I'm an optimist that in, that in the next few years, the Bosnia will dramatically be changed in a better way for everyone. Yeah, I, I, I agree. And, and I think that's a, that's a valid point, that the recent elections are hopefully a wind of change and that some new voices are coming through and some, some new, fresh, young blood that's uh, hopefully taking the nation into a new, uh, new direction. What's a common myth about war? That you hear, or that you that you've come across, common myth about the war. That's yeah. that's 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 an interesting question. I would ask you to rephrase it, but I understand what you what you, what you're asking me. Uh, common myth about the war. I don't know. Some some people got excited. Okay, let's fight. But you know, when 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 the time comes and uh, when you realize what's what really, that's the last thing you would. Uh, so the common myth is that. That might be the that might be the cool thing to to do. It, it is a cool thing to defend yourself and your right to defend your right for life. But in general, you cannot the war. I, I can say I can say enough enough bad things about the war, and I cannot say a single good thing about about the war as 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 it is. So so I'm I'm now I'm big as a war veteran as my as my the mates from the unit. We are big on a, on a peace. And uh, we we talked now to to each other. So when we talk now to the to the guys who were on the other side, you know, on the other side of the confrontation line, and when we talk about it, you know, we could talk 25 years ago, 30 years ago, without without shooting at each others. 
Oh, no have, need. Did you say you have spoken to some from the other side, quote unquote? Oh, oh yes, definitely, definitely. Because now 25, 30, 30 yeah. years after, when you talk to them, you understand they also have they also have their dreams, their needs. They also wanted to defend themselves and the families. And um, and I'm not talking about who is right, who is wrong. Yes, no, I'm talking exactly. I'm talking about yeah. that we could talk yeah. even even back then instead of instead of the, the fighting. So that, that would be my message. Let's exploit the every possibility to talk. Let's, let's have the dialogue. Let's, let's include the tolerance. Let's yeah. think about the others. Let, let's, let's have their shoes on yeah. to, to try to think what their needs are. And I believe if we have that wide approach and uh, to the issues and the problems, we can avoid some conflicts and save some lives. Even if you save just one, one life, you know, one life that that you you did, you yeah, did you did something you great. Say, yeah, that's, that's exactly yes. right. Um, I mean, I, I, I'm I'm very conscious that you're a you're you're a difficult person to talk about the uh, the the negative negative aspects of uh, uh, of conflict or war because you are ultimately uh, an optimist. But you did mention uh, about the mud in the trenches, and again, that's something that many of my compatriots or, or many of the people that I've served with or, or experiences my peers have had. It's certainly not of that kind of a war or war of the trenches. But I remember speaking to my dad about that, about the trenches and what that was like and, you know, lobbying, literally lobbying grenades at each other from one trench to the other. But then there were also moments where they'd just laugh and, you know, tell jokes about each other, yell at each other, you know, steal electricity from one trench to the other so they can watch the football. Do you have any yes. moments like that that's come to mind? Any of those kind of human moments, not necessarily the war, the fighting, but the human moment. Oh, yes, there, 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 there were many stories that some of them I personally experienced, some of them I've heard, and um, there were such nice, warm stories that that people, as you said, uh, not not only on the one side, they're speaking about muddy trenches, they were exchanging, you know, the cigarettes from trench to trench instead of the throwing the hand grenades. So. We're talking about just about ordinary people who found themselves in the storm of their life in a conflict that they didn't want and, uh, and, and that desire to survive, to see the end of that war. And definitely, there were, so there, there, there were many stories. Um, my personal story is that, that, that my grandfather, he, he was in a part of the Sarajevo that was the, under control of the, of the other side. Mm -hmm. And uh, during the night on the radio, I found there was there was my enemy i'm mm -hmm. quoting enemy yeah. on the radio that we start talking to each other and um, we talked in very civilized way about the war about the conflict and uh, he asked me if i can do him a favor i said i said okay go ahead what's happened is that that his grandma lived in a, in sarajevo that was on our side, yeah. our yeah. side, whatever is yeah. that. Yeah, whatever that means. Yeah. And, what and means. she was, and he heard that she was wounded. So he asked me if I would, if I would check on her. And, uh, and actually he, he explained me where, where, where to go. It was really kind of brave because he didn't know who he talked to and uh, what was going to happen to his grandma. Of course, I immediately ran the day after and it was the elderly lady who was at home. She was wounded, but she was okay. And, and I went over there, and uh, she explained me a little bit uh, about it. And uh, but I didn't ask her the details about about the person who asked me because I didn't know his name. He just asked me to go there to check her status and to report it back. Yeah. So identity is unknown. And and I got back the next night on the radio, and I told him that I went over there, and I explained him the door and where I go and what we talk. And he thanked me, and he asked me if he can, if he can do anything for me. I said, okay, what well, we are or that level of the trust. Yeah. So I asked him if he can go to check my grandpa that I haven't heard from him for months. Mm -hmm. And because my grandpa, he's from Dalmatia, mm -hmm. he has that uh, the, the specific accent, yeah. how the people are how, how the people are talking from the area, uh, you know, from, yeah. from the coast. So he went over, <laughs> excuse me, he went over there and uh, he talked to him. Day after when he talked to me, he said, well, uh, he's doing well, but he's not the, using very much the the letter N. Letter N is actually kind of that that's that's in in Dalmatian accent in Croatia, uh -huh. very specific. And and I didn't tell him, so yeah. so he really went over there to check on him, 
And when the war was finished, I never met, I never met that guy, but uh, my grandpa told me that the soldier was checking on him not once. He was going there frequently to see if they need anything. And he, 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 was, he was stopping by to see if they are doing well. And he just disappeared, you know, the war ended. Yeah. And I never, I never, I never found him. So, so it's 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 one very human, interesting story. And we were on the on the you know opposite sides. We were supposed to shoot each other. Yeah. And really, yeah. the last thing in my life would be to to shoot at him because yeah, what course. he did for me. What he did, yeah. And that's a, I mean, that's a that's a very touching story. And it's exactly the the type of uh, human story that I was uh, that I was hoping you would share because I think it also links to something I've heard you t- uh, say elsewhere. You know, is that people are nicer. Or were nicer to each other in war. What did you mean by that? Can you can, can, can you please can you please rephrase your question? I'm not sure that yeah, I understand. Yeah, so so I've heard you I've heard you elsewhere mention that people are nicer to each other, or that people were nicer to each other during the war than they were after the war, or they are now after the war. And that it was uh, people were nicer to each other during the war. Yeah, during the war. Yeah, that they were nicer but, to each other why? during the war. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. because yeah uh, yeah uh, during the war you, you can't have the status you can't uh you can't flash your new car you know or or, or go in the bar and uh and impress someone with with that material things so it's 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 just you yeah. it's just you so so just a human being just a person and people were really nice that uh the socializing and that camaraderie and uh, being uh being being of help for 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 others, you know, mm. that that was that was way of life. Yeah. Uh, I believe it's it's some kind of the just survival uh, mode that we are all in. You care about your neighbors, you care about the people around you. You are yeah. nice to them because there are no guarantees that you're going to survive the day after. So so you do your best, and, but at the same time, we don't have the any. We don't have the, any status symbols that we can impress someone. Yeah. You can impress someone only. Who, who you are yeah. so, so only by yourself kind of actually yeah, yeah, yeah. by yeah, your personality your what you do yeah, yeah. exactly yeah. what you do yeah. in your, your, in your deeds so, so so I believe that's that's maybe the, the closest to explain uh, why the people were nicer to each other and now now we go back so we go you know, we have jobs and yeah. we go for work and you know we have the, the city transportation we have our own you know worries everyone is doing kind of loans whatever mortgage so we are, we are we are back to that during the war it's just survival and you're just nice and you're trying to survive day by day without without big plan and, and, and maybe, no, maybe, maybe maybe that's the reason you know and certainly no uh, no city transportation i mean if uh, if your memory was similar to my dad's walking to the front lines and yeah uh, you know, no city transportation that, yeah, and, and no but but, but but let me uh, uh, allow me allow me to say that to say this that uh, that my friends with whom I became a friend during the war, and uh, we are still we are still really good friends, because uh, they couldn't impress me with their jobs, with their houses, cars, yeah. because they were who they who they are, yeah. and we met under the special circumstances, and we stayed friends friends for life, and that's the one thing that that I I really um, care about. We care about each other, and we yeah. see each other from time to time, and those are really kind of great people because because the circumstances that we met under are really are really special, and uh, it's not a privilege. Of course, war is not a privilege, yeah. but yeah. to have to have such a friends from that time is for me privilege, and I I I, I carefully kind of watching them, and uh, yeah. I, I keep them close to my heart. And to have gone through those shared experiences that are very unique. And, and as you say, you saw the people, you saw each other in the raw, you know, quote unquote naked without any other uh, social status, any professional status. It was just the That's human, exactly. yes. the, the, the human interaction at its most fundamental basic level of looking after each other, doing, doing right by each other, uh, extending a helping hand. Uh, which uh, which kind of takes me into the um, into the next part, and and, and you've touched on it. You've, you've mentioned the word of trust. How do we build trust after a conflict like that? Do we have a choice? Do we have a choice? Yeah. Because yeah. Uh, first we have to realize that the life is um, whatever we think about it. Life is temporary category, so yeah. we won't be here for 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 five hundred years. 
we are doing podcasts now. Someone will be listening two, three hundred years after. I don't think that many people will be interested to hear yeah. these stories yeah. unless we yeah. became really popular. You are, but I don't know. <laughs> so, so, so if you if you if you understand that we don't have the, all the time of this, you know, the, kind of, because life is tra- life is journey from point A to point B. I don't want to feel that journey with a suspicious mind, as Elvis yeah. would say. I would like I would like to be optimist. I would like to meet people to give the people the chances and to build the trust because that's I believe that's natural to us as humans. That's natural to us. It's not natural to us to be in conflict or not to trust each other because we are the social creatures. And actually, this pandemic shows us very well that we are very social creatures because we are missing our friends, we are missing our family, we are missing the hugs, we are missing that company going together, eating together and doing the things together. Yeah. So maybe after this pandemic, we will we'll become the better people and yeah. appreciate that hug or just, yeah. you know, the handshake. So, so building a trust, we don't, we don't have a choice. We have to do that. We have to promote those values you're talking yeah. about. And everything opposite to that is not normal to us. We are yeah. not created to think in a different way. And we can't be tired of repeating this and telling the people this kind of the stories. Yeah. We have to repeat it many times. Many times, why? Because we are right. It's the right yeah. thing to do, yeah. building the trust. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And, 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 and if we've got a bit more time, then um, I might take this into some more uh, uh, positive direction now. Also maybe, or, or maybe allow your optimistic nature to really shine because I'm really interested in, in how, how you became the triathlete, the Norseman, alpinist, all of these things that are part of your life now intimately, how did that come to be? I think that uh, what, what, I, what I learned and realized that we are not eternal creatures. So there is the beginning at, at, at the end. And I believe that we need to, we need to fill that, that space, that period with, with the good things and uh, what I, what, I, what I realized that we often believe that we can't do something, mm. but until we try, we don't know. So that's why, that's why I, I moved into the, let's say, the climbing, the high mountains, because mm. if someone else did it, there is no reason for me not to try. Mm. I'm not saying that, I'm saying that, that I will do it, but I will try at least. And uh, with that, Life philosophy, I climbed four out of the seven summits. Uh, mm. I did five Ironman races. I did that notorious Norseman, yeah. the, the most extreme, the yeah. Ironman distance triathlon in the world. Yeah. Very exclusive because it's ridiculous. Yeah. You start in the cold fjord, riding your bike over the five mountains, and then you yeah. run marathon to the top of the mountain. doesn't make any sense, but, <laughs> but uh, when, I was, when I saw that first time on YouTube, uh, it's tough, but they are not aliens. They are just yeah. human beings like everyone else. They just want that. They, they will just invest the time and effort to do it. So I told to myself, if I, if I ever get a slot, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finish it and complete yeah. it. And I, and I did it. So from this, from, from this time distance, uh, it was two years ago, I really, I, maybe it will sound that it's not, it's not being humble, but everyone can do it. But but it's not for everyone. Let's put yeah. it that way. Yeah. So you have to yes. put effort yes. and to, to work hard to achieve it. And whatever, whatever you want to achieve, if you work hard, you will get there. Sometimes sooner or later, but you'll get there if you work hard to achieve something. Yeah. So, and, and, and it's very fair game, and especially in the endurance sports, the marathon, triathlons, whatever you invest, you'll get it back. Yeah, absolutely, and I think it's a, a testament to your to your determination to to uh, to have done Norseman. I mean, I've I've looked into it a little bit to what it is, but also um, last time you and I spoke face to face was actually you showed me the the YouTube video of you being uh, you know invited to come because that's a that's a the luck of the draw literally is uh, uh, names are drawn and you know you nominate and some people are lucky, most are not. And I think you were the first person from, certainly from Bosnia, but I think also from the region that yes. went to complete Norseman. Is that, is that right? 
Yes, that, that's right. I was the first person from the former Yugoslavian republics, mm -hmm. which is the region of the 20 million people. Yeah. And uh, I was the first one who got enough lucky to get a slot for Norseman and I didn't have any doubts. Shall I go there and accept it? So, <laughs> yeah. so I went there, I'd been there and I did it. What yeah. I like about what I like about Norseman and that race uh, on their website, they are not inviting you to apply for the race because yeah. when you open the website, they say this is not for you. Mm -hmm. Nothing personal. This yeah. is not for you. Yeah. So uh, they provoke you to think about it. And it's unbelievable what we can do as a human beings yeah. and how far we can go only if you really want to do that. So let's translate that Norseman and, and Ironman races. And Klam is the highest peaks in the world. Let's just convert it and translate it into the, into the ordinary life, into the daily life. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that we can't do if we really want to do that after we realize that we can do Norseman climb the highest mountains? Yeah, of course. Yeah. What, what, what keeps you motivated? What drives you? Uh, that's, that, that's, that's, that's a good question. Maybe I wouldn't say, yeah, I'll go back to that. I, I'll go back to that um, explanation about the life. It's not forever. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we have no guarantees that we'll have the day after. We don't know that. Yeah. So maybe, maybe we should just do the good things and to try to take as much as we can and do sometimes the silly things but we are not supposed to forget about one thing in our life. That thing is called joy. We have, yeah. to, we have to smile. We have to enjoy it, to learn the new skills, to be nice to people, and also to do the things that we think that we are not capable of doing yet. Because the, there is no better thing to do something that you've been told, especially by others, no, you can't do that. Yeah. That's, 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 that's a great feeling, really. Yeah. So, yeah. so I, I, I'm encouraging all my friends and I was the first Ironman in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Now we have about 30, 40 people. Yeah, that's and actually, I dragged most of them into that, into that the yeah. life. And, and it's, not any, it's not anymore the triathlon. It's a lifestyle. Yeah. They, they, don't, they, they live the good life. They, 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 they eat well. They yeah. work out. And they're better for their community, too. Yeah. And they're nicer because they are so tired of trainings. <laughs> they have no any, uh, any energy left you know, for something else. Just be nice. Yeah, no energy left for negativity. I mean, and that's a. I mean, I think yes. that's a, that's a, that's a really nice way to put it because I mean, when you're so exhausted, when you're so focused and exhausted, uh, when yes. you have a purpose in life, you don't have time or will to focus on the or, or even to listen to those that are going to drag you down. And of course, yes. in order to succeed, right? In order to achieve that goal, you have to eat well. You have to sleep and rest. Uh, you have to, you know, plan your time. You have to, you know, you you have to become responsible for your life if you want to achieve it. And I think that's a that's very uh, emblematic of a life well lived, as you as you said at the start. There's one other thing, or maybe one final thing, I really want to talk about because it is probably one of my most vivid memories of you. Uh, I think it was uh, maybe two or three years ago. Now, Essen and I were running the half marathon that you helped establish. Uh, we were running ours. Uh, with weight weight vests that time, so you know I had ten kilos. Essen at seven, we were raising money for SOS Children's Village. Fantastic, we loved it. It was an amazing experience and and a challenging one. But at some point during the race, we were actually coming into the stadium, so we were coming down and we were about to go into the stadium. There comes Tomo with Mustafa. Right, you overtook us to, oh. uh, uh, and Mustafa being a blind runner. Now that was a, yes. that, I get goosebumps now thinking about it because as you were running and you were overtaking, you know, because you guys were running at a pretty decent pace, you were just overtaking people and you were you were on the inside lane, so to speak. And as you were running, people were basically all the runners were just clapping you guys along, Essen and myself included, because it was such a humbling moment, such an inspirational moment, uh, probably my most vivid memory that, that that I'll remember you for. But how does tell me about that experience? What was that like? Okay, uh, let's. Uh, no maybe, story just, short. maybe just give some context, actually, because I, I've, I've jumped the gun. What, yes. Uh, yes. Yeah, Long just, story short, I, yeah, was, yeah. I was reading the interview in the local, in the local media. Young boy uh, was saying um, that uh, he would like to be in a sport, but because he can't, because he's blind, and he can find he can't find a coach. Hmm. So I have I have a rule in my life. We have. Uh, you know the number one, 168. Number 168 is number of the hours in one week. Mm -hmm. And and you have to have 
four or five hours in one week out of the 168. Four or five hours is maybe three, four percent. You have to have those hours reserved for someone else to help someone else. If nothing, to help your neighbor, help your family, do something for the community. But always, uh, and when you do the math about the hours, you will always find that you are sometimes you're wasting your time, that you can use better your time. So four or five hours can be given to someone else because that's my rule. After I reading after reading that interview, I decided yes, I will be running with. Uh, I will suggest uh, his name is Mustafa. And I will suggest Mustafa though to run uh, with me, to train with me for about six months and uh, to run the half marathon at the end mm. with him. And that way he would become the first blind person in, in our region who, who completed half marathon as a blind person. And uh, my, my goal was to teach him because I'm, I'm older than he is, he's the age of my son. Mm. My goal was also to teach him something, to mentor him something uh, to mentor him, uh, but at the end of uh, at, the, at, at the end of our journey, when we completed that half marathon, he really run decent time, two hours, yeah, which is really yeah, nice. yeah, yeah. I realized that I learned I learned more from him that that what he learned from me. What what what, uh, because, what is that? I learned uh, because he's a young person. He's a blind. He don't he can't see what we see, and he's very happy and very joyful and very eager to learn. What he, what he proved after, we talk a lot and, 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 and we are still in the contact. We go out to have a coffee and have a lunch together. Uh, in the meantime, he graduated at the state university. He graduated the law at the state university and he became a lawyer. Wow. And uh, two months ago, he got a job. And uh, he's, now, he's now the first person in the public company in Sarajevo that's, that's the government company for the electricity who, who became the lawyer as a blind person. He's the first, first person in Sarajevo in the history of that company yeah. who is doing that job. So, so really, kind of, oh, I think that running that half marathon through the sport, we changed the perception of the public. We yeah. changed the rules of the game to a better. And we also helped the old people with disability to find their spot in our community, in our society. I apologize. And to... To be an uh, to be optimist that things can be done. So well, now we have the young lawyer who ran the half marathon. Yeah. Everything started there. He yeah. got enough the courage, enough the boost. Yeah. After that, that he has his kind of he has great life, and we are we are talking often. And I'm I'm really happy that I was part of that of that wonderful story. And also he's uh, he became the role model for the for the many. I'm not talking only about the person. With disabilities, uh, I, I'm talking about the people who has you no know, any issues with the health perspective. So, so it's a wonderful story, and I enjoyed it very much. And uh, I don't know, I learned a lot. I learned a lot from that from that episode in my life. Working working for six months with Mustafa and, and running with him that that race. I, I would like so. to add, we run yeah. we run three times a week. Yeah. So that's four, four or five hours. We we trained three times a week. Yeah. We had a lot of fun. And uh, ended up ended up really kind of couldn't couldn't be better. Now yeah. he's he's kind of he's a grown man. He has a job and yeah. interests, listening to music, and uh, he's educated yeah. as well. Yeah. University. Yeah. What a wonderful contribution! I mean, I think uh, uh, and I think it speaks to your greatness as well. I mean, what a wonderful contribution to to live by that creed to give four to five hours to someone else. I think that's a that's a that's a fantastic creed, and, and I think. Far, if, if far more people accepted that as a challenge, I think we'd live in a much, much, much better world. On that note, Tom, well, lest I take all of your four or five hours for this week, I'm sure there are other people that uh, will benefit from your time. I want to thank you for taking the time to speak with me. I think this was a, a greatly insightful conversation. And also thank you for speaking in English with me, which is certainly not the norm for us when we, when we, when we speak. Uh, we, of course, speak in our, in our native Bosnian, but... Um, Thank you for taking the time to speak with me in English in particular for this podcast. So you, you in Australia, you, you down, the, down, down, okay. under. <laughs> down under, down under, you speak English. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's what we okay. like to call it anyway. <laughs> yeah, yes. Thank you very much. I'm really honored. And, uh, and I, I still remember you when you introduced me to CrossFit as, as, as my first coach over there. Actually, I showed up. 
I showed up in the box with all my family. So my wife yes. and my son and we That's all right. work out together because yeah. it was also a way, great way to socialize and the way how you teach us. It's, it wasn't only workout. It, was, it yeah. was great socializing and a great time. And my son, he's still in that. So he's infected from yeah. that day. <laughs> and I, think that, I think that he also became the better person to spending some time with you and, and the way how you, how you work with us. Thank, Thank you, you for saying that. Thank you for saying that, Tom. And we'll, uh, we'll stay in touch and uh, speak soon. Definitely. Stay safe. Thanks for joining us for another episode of The Voices of War. You can access all episodes on www.thevoicesofwar.com or by subscribing wherever you get your favorite podcasts. And while you're there, please give us a review as we'd love to hear what you think. If you'd like to recommend a guest for the show, you can reach me on info at thevoicesofwar.com.